Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor Mills. Dot com, where if you go to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50, you can get 50% off your first order. That's factormills.com slash unbroken50. If you're like me and you are a person who is busy trying to create a life, heal, work on their health, wealth, and relationships, and not to mention deal with the day-to-days of normal life, you do not have time to be going to the grocery store and trying to figure out what you're going to cook every single day of the week. In fact, one time I did the math and I realized I was spending over 15 hours a week at the grocery store and cooking. When I added factor, I got to use that time for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my community, and for my business. And so if you're in the place where you need some more support in the kitchen, head to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50 to get 50% off. Welcome to the future of Legal THC. Moods THCA Flower. It's the most potent breakthrough in the world of federally legal cannabis. And now you have 10 high inducing strains of this smokable flower to choose from at hellomood.com, the best online dispensary that ships discreetly to your door. Great for beginner and veteran users, the experts at Mood have tailored different strains for curated moods. From euphoric and energized to creative and focused, Mood delivers the highest quality THC products you can trust. However, you like to take THC, Mood enhances awe-inspiring experiences with versatile products that go with whatever mood you're ready for, like their great-tasting gummies, convenient pre-rolls, classic flower, and so much more. Try Mood's new THCA flower today, and for 20% off your first order, plus a free pre-roll of THCA flower, go to hellomood.com and use promo code PODCAST20. That's hellomood.com, promo code PODCAST20, for 20% off your order and a free THCA pre-roll. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. 
And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. And yes. you talked about that leap of faith. What did what advice or thoughts do you have around people who are listening and they need to have that leap of faith that they've contemplated, they've been in pre-contemplation, they're a decision away from action? Because one of the things that I fear the most is that, you know, a, another person in a relationship or another child comes and exists in the childhood like I had, where it's hyper volatile and incredibly dangerous and you get hospitalized and all those. And I, I think to myself, like if if I were to give someone a piece of advice here, what would it be? What what is something that you believe can help somebody take that leap? My best advice for that would be to realize that you you have people that will help you. We we off, we feel isolated usually. I felt so isolated, like I couldn't trust anybody. And you have to you have to trust that somebody is going to be there for you. And especially when you're not in a physically abusive relationship, like nobody, nobody knew what I was going through. And I had to reach out to people and tell them what was going on. We try to keep it a secret. You know, we feel ashamed. We feel guilt. And narcissists especially are really good at making you feel that way. Like you have to trust in the people that you used to trust in. So family and friends, I would say that would be my best advice is you have to be vulnerable and you have to, which is so hard to do because a narcissist takes your vulnerability and just, they just brutalize you with it. Like just use it against you in every way. And you have to remember back, maybe re remember back before you were in that relationship, like who were your go-to people back then? Because now you're not the same person you were back then, but you want to, you know, those are the people who are going to be there for you now. So that would be, that would be my best advice is think about, you know, who were my go-to people before this happened and can I go to them now? I have to be, I have to put myself out there to get out of this situation that I'm in right now, because otherwise it's never going to change. And, and I, I'll have to say this, that the, the people around you will help you. And I think that a lot of people fear that they won't again, to your point about being in isolation is mm -hmm. people think, well, nobody's going to be able to help me. They don't get it. They don't understand. And I'm like, people get it. Like the, the one truth I know probably more so about the human experience than anything is that the people around you want to help you. They want to right. see you succeed. They want to get you out of these kind of experiences. And a lot of times they'll give you a couch or money or a car or whatever it is yeah. to help you get out of that. Because innately I do and inherently I do believe that people are good. Um, just unfortunately, sometimes there's a strength, you know, extreme circumstances that we get in. Right. So you're in this moment, you're in the U-Haul, you call your friend. What's next? Because I think this is kind of the pendulum swing, right? It really was. It, it was, that was, I would say that, I wouldn't say that was the hardest day of my life though. Honestly, there was a moment probably nine months before that where I suddenly realized that he's never going to change. And that was my lowest point. And it was like three months after we got married, I realized he, he was never going to change. But in that moment, the moving out moment, honestly, I can't remember much from that day. I was, I was in such just shock, disbelief. You know, I was, you're almost, it's almost like an external body experience, right? Like I'm just going through the motions I get the U-Haul to the house. He knows I'm moving out. 
He's he keeps every room that we're in. He keeps coming into that room and just standing in the doorway, just standing there watching me. And I had to go. I had to take boxes and just start in one corner of each room and just go around and start throwing stuff in boxes. And I was so detached from all of that. Just there was no emotion. There were no emotions that day. I was just I just I was very task oriented. I have to get these things done. And by the end of the day, you know, my body was exhausted and my mind was numb and I just collapsed into my my new house. I just collapsed and just cried for probably six hours, honestly. And my phone, my phone was blowing up, right? Because the whole time I'm moving out, he's texting and calling every everybody I know my family, my friends, he's calling everybody I know to tell them that I'm leaving him and he doesn't know why. So not only am I trying to get through the day and get my stuff done and moved, my daughter's there with her boyfriend trying to get, you know, get their stuff done. My phone is blowing up with family and friends. He's hovering over me like this whole day is just, is so exhausting. And the next day was so exhausting. I couldn't even I couldn't even start unpacking. I just laid in bed most of the day. You know what? What came to mind is I feel like, and I don't know, I wasn't there. So this is why I'm asking you the question. <laughs> this must have been to some extent a sense of relief. And if it was, where does the healing journey start in this? The day after was a bit of a relief. And then, so I moved out on a Friday. Saturday was a bit of a relief. You know, I kind of relaxed and just, like I said, stayed in bed and thought about how what I was going to do next. I was starting a new job on Monday because when I moved out, I didn't have a job. We uh, We owned a business together and he was keeping the business and I had to go get a job. And then Sunday rolls around and I start unpacking things and feeling really good and all excited for my job the next day. And it was probably four or five days after I actually moved out that I thought, holy shit, what did I just do? How am I ever going to survive without him? And how, how am I going to, how am I going to do this? I was trying to think of, you know, the reality of it and I wasn't making very much money. I didn't know how I was going to afford rent, you know, like I was good for one month, but what happens when bills come due next month? And so I started to miss him. I started to question my decision. And now, you know, he's contacting me. He wants to know if I, you know, what he did wrong, what he can do to make it right. He's doing the whole love bombing thing, trying to get me to come back to him. And this this cycle just goes on for months, honestly. I I would go talk to him and try to work things out. We're we're married, you know, maybe if we live in separate houses, but we still see each other, everything's going to be okay. We can work it out. And it took two, two and a half or three years actually before all of that stopped. And I finally started my healing journey and realized who, who he really was. So the healing didn't, didn't by any means didn't start when I moved out. That You can't just get out of a toxic relationship you know there's it was there was so many ups and downs and so many things that happened in the two years after i moved out and yeah it was probably it was probably three years after i moved out before my healing actually started Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Just want to take a moment and invite you to be my guest at Think Unbroken Conference this November. That's right. Think Unbroken is hosting our Unbroken Con for free. It's five days of trauma transformation information with myself, special guests, and even some of the leading experts in trauma education from around the world. For five days, we're going to jump into what it means to actually take the steps to be Unbroken. All you have to do is register for free at unbrokencon.com. That's U N B R O K E N C O N.com. That's right. Five days of trauma transformation information with me, special guests, and some of the world's leading trauma trained experts for free for five days this November. More details to come. But in the meantime, go to unbrokencon.com to register. And I'll see you there. What do you think? Is there something that you can point to that is 
I don't want to necessarily use the word practical, but the word practical comes to mind. Was there something practical in this journey that helped you step into the ability of trusting yourself? Or was it just like, fuck it, what do I have to lose? Because for me, I learned how to trust myself from being like, fuck it, what do I have to lose? I think there was definitely an element of what do I have to lose? Because like, you know, it was surreal sometimes being in the in this position where, you know, uh, I, I didn't really know what to do a lot of the time. I was learning on the job. So um, there was a little bit of that. But then there was also that part of me that, you know, I really loved myself. I learned to love myself, you know, because of that, going back to that self-esteem piece. I had decided I was going to have high self-esteem. And when I realized that mm. that meant self-love, you know, that even that's a difficult journey because I'll tell you, I had a lot of people tell me, you're conceited or whatever that looks like. And it's like, no, I, I, I've never looked at what another person had and been jealous or upset with them. I'm like, awesome. How do I get that? That was not my experience. Yeah. I was yeah. like, how do I do that? Like, I just need to learn. You know, I'm very happy for that person. Do you, so I, I want to rewind real quick because I think this would be really empowering for people listening. When you were navigating self-love, self-esteem, what made you realize like one equals the other? And what was the process of you said you chose to learn how to love yourself and to love yourself? Yeah. What did that process look like? Because I think like people are so fucking stuck in not doing that. I think you're right. I think a lot of people are stuck in not doing that. But I mean, I think it was a little bit of an evolution. You know, when I when I think back at like how I was in those special ed classes and 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 when I would see somebody struggling, I, I would try to help them. And I started realizing that I felt really good about myself doing that because now they're feeling better about themselves. And so it was a little bit of at, at that in the early stages, it was more. And and I heard I don't know I don't know if there's like a a quote or a study I read something one time that said something that you know you can ha the happiest people are not the people who have the most they're the people that give the most. I didn't know that back then, but you know looking back I I can I can see how that did benefit me. I was I found a lot of happiness and love for myself in just being giving of myself, and I I still today I mean I, I think. If you hang around with me, you'll know that, you know, I'll do anything for the people around me so long as they're not like taking me down. Yeah. Because that was a boundary I had to learn later in life, right? That I can't help people who, there's some people you can't help, yeah. right? And that's a whole other thing. But. Yeah. I, let, let's talk about that because sure. I think that matters because, you know, I, I have this thought, you know, and, and this might have come from Grant Cardone and planted it in my brain, but he he said one time, like, Mother Teresa flew around on private jets. And I was like, that's such a really fascinating point because you're able to still give and have this amazing, powerful, beautiful life. Giving does not equal taking away from yourself. And yeah. I think so many people feel like, well, if I want to give, if I want to help the world, if I want to make a betterment of my environment, that means I have to sacrifice, I have to be poor, I have to like be all these things. But I've come to discover that's not true at all. Like you can be successful in life and give and not have to sacrifice and be poor and all those things. But in that process, something that you just pointed to that I think is incredibly profound and important is recognizing that sometimes people are going to try to take you down with them. Yeah. What does that look like and how do you navigate that? I, I think for me, it's always showed up as some sort of like um, negative being put towards me, right? So somebody saying, oh, well, that self-love looks like conceited. It's conceited. So they always try to spin it in that way. Or, you know, even in it, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this. The, you're, you want to know what it, what the, um, what helping somebody who doesn't want to be helped look like. And I think for me, a lot of times it just shows up as somebody who's not changing. You know, I give a lot of business advice to people today. I mean, a lot of people come to me. I, you know, uh, just to to give some perspective to your audience. You know, I've worked with over 800 businesses in 800 in 16 countries, grow, scale their businesses, 
create alignments with their team. Because one of the things that I realized at Gatemaster early on was if I don't help these people with their businesses, this product's not going to be successful. Because it was, it, it, it was such a new product or idea. I mean, point of sale wasn't even really a thing. People were still using Casios. We were going in and replacing these old Casio cash registers with software. And a lot of these people didn't know how to use software. But then in addition to that, they didn't know how to run their businesses. So now, today, a lot of people, because of that experience, I mean, I, I went to 800 locations in 16 countries. When I say that, I've worked with many more businesses than that. I've lost count at this point. But when a lot of people come to me looking for business advice, you know, there comes a point where it's like, either they got to do it or they're not going to do it. And I can't waste my time anymore. Right? Because these, it's, it's their goal. I try to help people find clarity on their goal because it's an important, I think another important step that maybe um, I didn't talk about here, but you know, for me and you know, part of the reason I go by big goal energy is because having these big goals out there in the future really did help me stay the course. Even when I doubted myself, I just kind of knew where I wanted to go. I knew I wanted, I bought my first house. I knew I wanted a second house someday and next time it was going to be bigger, right? And actually when I married Jake, he bought our first house. I bought our second house. You know what I mean? And it was just this fun game that we've, we've always kind of done together is, is what can we, what can we do together and build together? But having these big goals out there really kept me on the course. And so I try to help people figure out what their goals are, but there comes a point with a lot of people where they give up on themselves. They give up on their goals. You know, and I have to be like, this is your goal, not mine. I got to kind of back off of putting in my time, energy, and resources into helping you achieve your goals. And, and to me, that's what that looks like Yeah. now, right? I mean, I don't really surround myself with people who aren't driven. I just can't mm. because it, it's, there's only so much time, you know, I mean, when we, we look at our lives and what we want to accomplish, I'm not trying to cut anybody out for any, uh, because I don't love people. I love everybody. I mean, I, I, I can't even think of a person I don't like, really, you know, and I, and I mean that sincerely. But um, I know that I only have so much time. I mean, I've been with Gatemaster for 20 years. That's a long time to do something. Yeah, you know, I became CEO in 2010. And, um, and when I arrived there, I thought, this is awesome. You know what I mean? Like I'm a CEO now. I, I became a CEO. You know, there's some interesting statistics in tech, you know, only about 26%. I think actually it's 24% are women in tech. Maybe 15% of, uh, females get to be tech CEOs, but the amount of women exiting tech is 45 times higher than men. That's a lot. You know, so that also, once I became a CEO, I became a mission of like, I've got to hang in here. I've got to hang in here. I've got to, I have a lot to prove now. Mm. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show. But I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. In that, one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about is you know, there are people who right now they're starting to maybe, and maybe and even just listening to this for the first time, have this moment of clarity and think, oh, wow, maybe there is some symbiosis between this experience and childhood and this person I'm in a relationship with. How do, it was for me, like having a moment of recognition about this was, was kind of like literally an epiphany. It was like a holy shit moment, but how can somebody note was, was that the same for you? I'm trying to like 
draw a path for people mm. to create a foundational understanding of being able to recognize whether or not they may be in a similar situation as what we used to be in. Yeah, totally. Well, for those starting off who might just be learning about this for the first time, there's always one tip that I find very helpful to share to, with folks. And it's to look at the relationship you're currently in or look at past relationships and to actually identify how is it that the other person makes me feel, right? How do I actually feel when I'm around this person? And I've gotten a, a, a range of different answers of I feel unimportant to all these people I date. I never feel like I get enough attention. Um, uh, I never feel like I'm enough or I feel like I'm too much. I feel like I can't commit to them, right? There's always some common denominator of the way that you actually feel in that relationship. And then to tie that feeling with someone from your past who also made you feel the same way. And I can almost guarantee you there's going to be a clear connection that comes up for you. That it's probably mom or dad or someone who raised you or someone from your past that was a very important relationship for you. Yeah. And, and when you're in that, I think that can be super unsettling for people. Yeah. Right. And I think predominantly if it's the first time you've come to that realization and you're like, it, for me, I was like, oh my God, this is like the worst moment of my life. Right. Cause they're like, <laughs> what is happening right now? And, and, and you kind of actually kind of realize like you're also playing a factor and a role in that. And I think that there's a, a level of reconciliation that has to happen. And so, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is you're like, all right, I'm in this place. I'm super successful. I'm a high performer and I'm going to make this a uh, personal statement. I resonate with that tremendously because that's mm -hmm. where I was super successful, high performer relationships, disaster. <laughs> you got it. Right. And, and, and I'm like, same as you hopeless, romantic, seeking, hoping, praying somebody be that fix that thing to fill my cup. How do you, how do you like reconcile the fact that like, here I am super successful, but this one thing that maybe probably should matter more is a complete wreck. Yeah. Oh gosh. I'm getting flashbacks to years ago, <laughs> but you know, I will tell you something about this. One thing I think it's really important to mention is being good at relationships. It's not this, you know, elusive random thing that only happens to lucky people. And I think that when we grow up with all of these very dysfunctional examples, it's really easy to believe that, right? It's easy to believe these scarcity, you know, these are false narratives that, um, you know, there's so few good people out there or there's no one out there for me. And we kind of get stuck in these narratives and it can make relationships feel very random. Um, and you know, like, like it's not possible for you, but it's, it's just a skill like everything else. Like if you're an entrepreneur, it, you didn't just build a business by like guesswork, right? Like you actually had to implement skills and pull it together. But becoming securely attached is also a skill too. These are things that we can actually learn when it comes to regulating your triggers and relationships, um, you know, managing the, the connection, finding the right people. Uh, but you know what, Michael, I think what I'll say to that is taking responsibility in your choices in these relationships is probably the first step. I, I mean, I know you know this, but to, to those people listening, Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show, but I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. I mean, I was at a point where I was just blaming everyone else, right? I was thinking, well, this guy sucks, that person sucks, right? Um, and I was always putting the blame 
on them. Like they were the toxic ones, not me, not me. I'm over here, you know, crushing it. I'm, I'm a boss babe. Right? And I, I, you know, like I, I was avoiding personal responsibility, but the fact was there was only one common denominator in all these relationships. It was me, right? Like I was choosing to go on these dates with people. I was the one choosing to stay for 12 freaking months with someone that didn't want to call me his girlfriend. You know, at that point there, I couldn't even blame him anymore. It was just, I was the one that was allowing it to happen. And damn, that gutted me, right? To realize that, wow, maybe I have a part to play in this as well. Um, and I, I saw a smile on your face. If <laughs> maybe you, you felt that way before too. So I think taking radical responsibility for your journey and what you want and what you truly deserve in relationships has to come first before we're even ready to talk about the strategic and the healing piece. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm, I'm smiling because I'm like, uh, yeah, take fucking responsibility for your life. Yeah. And, and it's hard, right? Because it's. It's so much of the causation and correlation where you find yourself uh, effectively building a life that you had already once lived because it's comfortable, right? right? I mean, what's what's more comfortable than known experiences, right? And until you're willing to face the other side of that and the discomfort in this context is like uh, empathy and compassion and grace and love and acceptance and being mm -hmm. claimed, right? Like. What's more scary than that? I've never had that before, so I'm going to shy away from it. But but even in that moment of like, for lack of a better term, this coming to Jesus experience where you're like, oh <laughs> shit, wait a second, this is on me. Right. I, I, I feel that one of two things typically happens. One being people go, all right, well, this is just acceptance. This is what I deserve. This is what I'll continue to have. Sands a rock bottom, potentially. Right. And, and the other being like, I'm going to destroy myself. I deserve this. I'm a piece mm -hmm. of shit. How do you step through that space? Oh, that's such a good nuanced question. I've never heard anyone ask it quite like that before, because you're totally right. I think, you know, as the high achiever, we can, we, we're so good at polarizing things and either going this way or the other way. Right. So I really believe it's about finding that middle balance. I mean, the reason intimate relationships are so hard for, you know, people like me is we feel safe in our professional life because that's where we've established our authority, but we don't feel safe with this relationship stuff because it's totally new to us. But when it comes to taking responsibility uh, and not having it go, you know, go through this downward spiral, uh, now one half, I think it's really important to be in a community or work with someone that can show you what it's like on the other side, because how do you, you know, if I've never seen what a healthy relationship looks like, I have no point of reference to even get there. Um, so, you know, whether it's therapy or working with a coach or even reading a book, I think having some sort of external guidance is always very helpful when you're going somewhere that you've never been to before. Um, but combining that radical responsibility with compassion and self-compassion, I think is the sweet spot. So it's not only this, oh, it's all my fault, right? Like I made all these choices, like I'm the toxic one, but we have to pair that with the understanding of why we have made those choices. I wasn't a bad person for choosing these people. It was because that's all I've ever known. I didn't know any better. I thought I was dating people that on paper would have been good matches for me, but I was not in connection with my body. I didn't know what my type should be based on my attachment style. Right. And so I was just repeating wounds. And so when we do make mistakes, I think it's super important to take responsibility for our own actions, but also pair that with that unconditional self-compassion as well. So that we're not just beating ourselves up. How does one start to tap into awareness when the only thing that we've ever known or understood is that following our intuition leads to ramifications. Thus, as a defensive mechanism, we've learned to stop listening to ourselves. 
one thing that has helped me um, immensely, and I still do it today, is because the thoughts in my head were very self-destructive for a long time, I needed to start putting different words into my head, different, different voices into my head than my own. And so what I did in that, like the, when I reached that tipping point and I decided to pivot and become healthy, um, or become healthier is I had to start having a voice in my head that was again, different than my own. So that's where listening to, um, personal development audio, whether it, um, used to be CDs, <laughs> whether now it's podcast and YouTube and audio books. Um, but that having that different person in my ear that was infusing positive energy, positive thoughts, and reminded me that I was worth taking care of, that is what helped me to start making incremental changes. And some of those, in, the earliest changes I made to start taking care of myself were some of the hardest. Like, starting to brush my teeth and bathe regularly were really hard for me because I didn't feel I deserved even like deserving of that basic self care. So because my inner voice was telling me I wasn't deserving, I needed somebody else to interject in that, you know, um, I guess just story I had going through my head and I needed them to input a different story. And and so that's why, and even today, I'm constantly listening to podcasts and audiobooks because they help remind me of where I'm heading and where I want to be and make sure that I'm on the right path. And so I encourage anyone that's, you know, in those very low moments and it's really hard to, um, you know, to even figure out how to get through the day is to to work on, on interjecting new energy and new input. Yeah, I, I respect that. And I, I believe that's totally practical, right? And, and from the outside looking in, if someone's in the beginning of this journey and they're not sure about this, and even myself, I used to look at guys like Tony Robbins, I'm like, this guy's full of shit, right? And that's because what I was afraid of was recognizing the potential that I had within myself to create the life that I wanted to have. And in that process, I came to the understanding that self-talk is everything in this game. There are people right now saying things, and I said things to myself, that you would get arrested for, or you get punched in the face. And it's, it's incredible to me to think about the power of reframing that talk in my own personal life. And I've come to the understanding and belief that what you think is what you speak. What you speak becomes your action. Your action become your reality. Talk to me about the, the pivot and the journey and more so the way you used to talk to yourself versus the way you talk to yourself now. Oh, yeah. So, so and in NLP, reframing is a very important technique with us. And, um, and, and I've used reframing through much of my healing journey. And so when I reached that pivot, that, you know, tipping point and decided to pivot, um, I had to figure out, like, I was immensely overweight. And so I had to figure out, like, how was I going to start taking care of myself? And I had to start getting out of my home. That was part of my issue is I was staying in my home all the time. And so I decided to start um, being around other people. And I, I started getting together with meetup groups and in walking groups and hiking groups. And with being morbidly obese, anytime we walked up even just a little hill, I felt like I was cr climbing Mount Everest. I was so out of shape. Um, but something interesting started to happen as I started hiking. I started to see that I got stronger with each hike. Like physically, I was stronger. And something else started to happen. Because I was so overweight and each hike was hard, I had to mentally work through that difficulty to keep going during the hike and not give up. And so after each hike, even if it was a short hike, I would have to look at it and I would say, I would look at it and be like, I didn't think I could do that. I didn't think I could finish, but I did. 
And so what it started showing me is I was actually stronger than I gave myself credit for. I didn't think that I was strong enough to make it through my traumas. I didn't think I was strong enough to get through everything on my own, especially after my ex died. I didn't think I could go on. But as I started to progress through higher mountains and longer climbs, I started to prove to myself that I was strong. And that is where I could start reframing those I guess the story that I was telling about myself, the belief I had about myself is that instead of looking at all that I had lost from my traumas, I started to look at what I had gained from them. You know, I started to look at the strength and resiliency it took for me to stay standing with each progressive, you know, stronger blow that life threw at me. And I just, that was really important for me. And still today, reframing is very significant that I look at any setback I still have today and I look, I shift it and I look at what is the positive in it. And, um, and it's really been transformative for me. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. There's so much power in that because when you control the way that you talk to yourself, but also understand that you have to develop resilience in that and resiliency in that to be able to step into it time and time again and understand the power of that. And, and while you're in this position of like being in nature and seeing the world and seeing trees and mountains and things like that, like you must have abs absorbed that environment and, and, and saw something powerful in it. Did you feel like being in nature was a part of this journey for you? Uh, absolutely. So um, part of my background is that um, I was a biology professor for 12 years. And so I love everything science. And so being in nature, what was really interesting for me is I started to notice examples of resiliency in nature. I started to pay attention to how trees would navigate, navigate around rocks, like obstacles, like rocks, and how their root systems would allow them to stay anchored, even though they were trying to get over this rock, and how they would bend to reach the sunlight, and how they would just make it work. And no matter what, they would bend and turn. And I started to see, like, because I know that all living organisms have certain things in common, if trees and other plant life and animals can exhibit resiliency in nature, I started to see and remind myself that that same resiliency is possible in me. So if something that can't get up and move around, like a tree, can figure out how to get around an obstacle and still not only survive but thrive in an environment, I could do that as well. So seeing that resiliency in nature was very therapeutic for me, but it was also, I think, therapeutic in that just getting out of my home, but also like it just being in nature opens up possibilities in your mind, you know, um, and I just, I can't say enough. And even today, I still hike at least once a week because being in nature is just so helpful to me and my spiritual, it's part of my spiritual practice. We'll be right back to the show, my friend, but I wanted to let you know about our brand new podcast community for Think Unbroken Podcast. I know that for so many trauma survivors like myself, for the longest time, I felt alone, like nobody got it, nobody understood, and that I was just going to have to figure this out on my own. But that's not true. And the reason why we created our brand new Think Unbroken Academy podcast community is so that we can bring all the members of the Unbroken Nation together in a place where we can learn, grow, heal, change, and transform our trauma into triumph. I would love to have you come and be a part of the brand new community. Just check out thinkunbrokenacademy.com or click the link in the podcast description. And I cannot wait to see you there, my friend. Again, just head over to thinkunbrokenacademy.com. And until then, be unbroken. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. 
Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review. And you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program.